So the Town and Country Planning Association uh, uh, is a charity and a membership organisation with the vision of homes, places and communities in which everyone can thrive. And over the last 125 years, we have worked to challenge, inspire, support um, and uh, help people to create healthy, sustainable and resilient places that are fair to everybody. Our priorities draw on our heritage and the TCPA was founded uh, by the originators of the Garden City movement who sought to transform places, um, the way that places are created uh, for the common good. Uh, and we continue to champion the Garden City principles as a way to create successful and high quality places. Um, and obviously in the current context um, and that of new towns, that's um, a really important thing that we're continuing to work upon. Next slide, please. So the way uh, that places are planned, designed, maintained and regenerated um, can help or it can hinder um, work to tackle health inequalities, to tackle the issues of climate change, uh, flooding, which is obviously a very recent, uh, recent thing in our memories over the last couple of weeks, um, but also things like economic resilience. Um, and the TCPA uh, works on a wide range of intersecting topics um, that covers you know, garden cities and new towns, parks and green infrastructure, healthier placemaking, uh, which is my role, uh, climate change and community participation and social justice. Um, so my name is Gemma Hyde. Sorry, I should have said that before now. I'm a projects and policy manager at the TCPA um, around healthier placemaking. So our work is a real mixture of sort of campaigning, publishing research, acting as a critical friend, uh, providing training, influencing policy and decision makers and enabling action. And uh, we reach thousands of people every year um, and try and engage them through workshops and conferences, webinars like this one. Um, and we work, seek to work at both the national and the local level. Um, so we are uh, lobbying government around um, uh, national policy, but also work on things like this planning for healthy places guidance uh, focused at the local level. Um, if you are interested in any of the uh, subjects and themes that we work on um, and also hearing more or seeing more about the events that we run, then please do visit um, our website, which is tcpa.org.uk. Next slide, please. So for the planning uh, healthy places guidance, we've collaborated with TRUDE, uh, the TRUDE research programme. Um, and we really enjoy um, and value collaborating with, with others when we do things like this because uh, they bring sort of different uh, knowledge and experience to the table. So TRUDE stands uh, for tackling root causes upstream of unhealthy urban development, um, which again is quite a mouthful, um, but uh, they are working um, with decision makers and communities to prioritize um, health in urban uh, decision-making processes. And this work focuses on um, how non-communicable diseases, so things like diabetes, cancers, respiratory illnesses, um, anxiety and depression, and health inequalities can be prevented by changing the way uh, that urban development decisions are made. So it's a five-year research, research programme uh, funded by the UK Prevention uh, Research Partnership. Um, and we're really pleased to be able to work with them on, on this guidance. Next slide, please. So both TRUDE and the TCPA recognise that where people live matters. So speaking at the TCPA annual conference in 2022, uh, the chief medical officer said, if you look back over the last 150 years, more has been done for public health by proper planning than almost any other intervention except perhaps vaccination. So the environments in which we are born, where we grow up, where we play, where we live, where we work and where we age are key uh, for creating and maintaining good physical and mental health. And there is lots and lots of evidence that supports this. Um, and, and that evidence has been around now for quite a few years. And so what this planning for healthy places guidance does is it draws on that and helps to interpret it in a way that is useful for local plan making. So estimates vary, but most of what makes and keeps us healthy is outside of the health and social care sector. Um, and to quote Lord Nigel, Lord Nigel Crisp, uh, health is made at home and in our communities and hospitals offer repairs. So placemaking and planning local policy is deeply important to create and maintain and protect good health in our communities. Next slide, please. 
So in a moment, you're going to hear more about the planning for healthy places guidance. But it is important to note that in addition to the document itself, uh, the TCPA, through its funding from Sport England, can offer further support to places wanting to create healthy local plans and planning policy. So this support uh, can be tailored to the local context that you're working in. Uh, it could be facilitating workshops or training, helping you convene all the different stakeholders that are interested um, in pursuing this. Uh, it can be through this critical friend advice when you're drafting policy, um, and we can also support things uh, like neighbourhood planning as well. Um, so it's, you know, we what we want to do here is not just give you a document and send you on your way, but we're more than happy um, to help support you and um, to use that document in a way that, um, you know, actually moves things forward for your local area. Um, and if you're interested in that, you can get in touch um, and the contact details uh, for myself on the TCPA will be available um, at the end and through an email that we send uh, after this uh, webinar. Next slide, please. So it is my pleasure to hand over to Dr. Emma Bird, um, who's lead co-author of the guidance and who's going to actually say a bit more um, about the document itself. Over to you, Emma. Great. Thank you so much, Gemma. And good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to see so many people on the call this afternoon. Um, so as Gemma said, I'm Emma Bird and I'm a senior lecturer in public health at UE Bristol. And as part of my role, I'm a researcher on the TRUD project that Gemma just referred to. Now, one work stream of the TRUDE project is focused on health considerations in local policies and plans. So I'm here today to help launch and introduce our Planning for Healthy Places guide that has been designed to help improve the ways in which health is embedded in local plans. Now, for some of you on the call who may be new to planning terminology, local plans, when I refer to them, are talking about um, a statutory planning document that every local planning authority must prepare and adopt, setting out strategic development and land use priorities for the next few decades. Next slide, please. OK, so I'm going to start by describing the overall intent of the guide that we've produced. So it's been developed in response to our research and direct work with local authorities in recent years which has shown that local plans have the potential to create healthy places, but they are often weak and inconsistent in how exactly this can be achieved. So in other words, we've identified a clear gap between what local authorities want to achieve in terms of creating healthy places and available guidance on exactly how to do it. Now our planning for healthy places guide has two broad aims. Firstly, to raise awareness about the links between planning and health. And secondly, to support those working across urban and rural local authorities in England to promote health through local plans. Our guidance is ultimately based on evidence um, and has been explicitly designed to be user friendly, practical and inspirational in terms of offering a process and support for creating healthier local plans. It includes, as we'll see a little bit later, signposting to useful resources and highlights examples of high quality adopted policy from across England. Now, in developing our guide, we absolutely recognise that there are uh, lots and lots of useful guides and toolkits and frameworks in existence in the area of planning and health. But until now, we're not aware that there are any specific guides designed to help local authority officers know where and exactly how to begin in developing health focused local plans. Importantly, we could not have produced this guidance on our own. So to ensure that it was relevant and valuable for those working in local authority contexts, we've co-developed it with the support of 12 planning and public health officers drawn from 12 local authorities across England. And we've selected these local authorities um, deliberately, purposefully, um, to make sure we represented diversity in terms of where the local authorities were at in terms of local plan development stage, local authority type, geography, and uh, local planning authority levels of deprivation. 
Next slide, please. Now, our guidance is primarily intended for local pl planning authority based officers working in planning policy and development management. Also, local authority public health officers working on perhaps health in all policies, wider determinants of health and healthy places. Also, councillors and others that may have responsibilities for place, planning, public health and community well-being. So very broad. Having said that, we have also designed the guidance to have appeal to an even wider range of audiences from different professional backgrounds and levels of understanding about planning and uh, public health. So we believe that it may also be useful for other local stakeholders, for example, uh, transport planners and uh, sustainability and climate teams, and also national stakeholders, maybe um, the LGA or the Association of Directors of Public Health. And with my academic hat on, we feel it may also be useful as a teaching resource for academics and researchers involved in undergraduate and postgraduate teaching of students on planning and public health courses. Next slide, please. So I'm now going to present our approach to preparing healthy local plans and planning policies. And what you can see here is our planning healthy places framework. And you can see that it is organized under three themes. We've got universal policy and implementation guidance. The first theme, universal guidance, considers how health should be characterized and justified in the local plan and it explores the role of collaboration and health impact assessment at the plan making stage. Our second thematic area is policy guidance, which examines strategic and specific health related policy areas that developers should be expected to consider when they're making planning applications. And then finally, we've got a section on implementation guidance, which covers how policies and other mechanisms in the local plan can support policy implementation for better health outcomes. Now, these three thematic areas each highlight key features that local plans should cover, and we explore how those involved in developing local plans could go about achieving this in real world settings. Next slide, please. So this slide here demonstrates that each of our three broad themes has a number of sub themes within it. And this essentially forms a checklist of the key things that we think you should consider as part of the plan making process. So if we start with universal guidance, you'll see that we, as part of this, discuss the importance of collaboration between local authority officers from perhaps public health, planning and beyond. And we consider how to actually achieve good collaboration in the real world. We also explore the types of strategies and evidence held at the local level, as well as strategies, standards and guidance that's been produced nationally that can feed into local plan development. Under the second theme, the policy guidance, we discuss how to identify and incorporate health related policy areas into local plans that developers should be expected or encouraged to consider when they're making their applications. Now you'll see here that this is quite a broad theme. Um, firstly, we explore strategic health policy. So by this, we're referring to authority-wide policies that reflect the aspirations of each council. So for example, those that are set out in uh, local authority corporate plans, and it also includes guidance on undertaking health impact assessment of proposed developments to inform design and detail. And finally, this theme presents numerous and specific policy examples from adopted local plans that have been mapped against five evidence based features of the built and natural environment that can be influenced by local planning policy. And you can see those are listed here, the final five bullet points. And this has really come about because our research has shown that demonstrating precedent of existing adopted policies from elsewhere in England can really help to make the case for their inclusion in your own local plans. 
Then finally, when we look at the implementation guidance theme, this helps the reader of our guide to think about how local plans can be written in a way that supports the implementation of health, health requirements. So essentially to try to overcome the risk of developers compromising on policies and planning conditions in development projects after planning consent has been achieved. Now for each of these three sub-themes, um, or three main themes, we've produced specific recommendations and strategies for how to action each recommendation, as well as providing direct examples from adopted local plans, and we've included lots of links to useful wider resources. So to demonstrate how this looks in practice, um, I'm going to briefly talk through two of our sub-themes to give you a feel for the resource. Um, firstly, health impact assessment of local plans from the universal guidance theme. And then secondly, the healthy transport and movement um, sub-theme from policy guidance. Next slide, please. Okay, so as part of our guidance, we recommend that local authorities commit to a health impact assessment of the local plan. So very briefly, for those who may be new to the idea of health impact assessment, it is a process which supports organisations to assess the potential consequences of their decisions on people's health and well-being. Now, to action this recommendation, we suggest that local authorities conduct health impact assessment during the preparation of local plans. And in our guidance, we discuss different types and scope of health impact assessment and how this will very much depend on the structure of your local authority. So for example, if you're unitary or two tier, the level of resource you might have available and timelines for the production of your local plan. Next slide, please. We then go on to flag an example of good health impact assessment integration that we found from the London Borough of Havering in which they conducted a desktop health impact assessment of their local plan using the Hoodoo tool, which is um, a rapid health impact assessment tool. Now, those who undertook that health impact assessment reported that the process helped to demonstrate at a local level the impact that development can have on health and well-being, and it helped the team to identify where there were opportunities to enhance health gains and mi mitigate negative impacts in their local plan. Now, our guidance includes links to Havering's local plan, the supporting health impact assessment report, and also links to wider tools and guidance on the broad idea of undertaking health impact assessment. Next slide, please. So example two here is focused on promoting healthy transport and movement through the local plan. Now, probably all of us on the call today know from the evidence base that engaging in active travel can impact positively on a range of climate, health and social outcomes. For clarity's sake, um, active travel, when we refer to this, encompasses activities, among others, um, but including walking, cycling, wheelchair trips, scooters, and public transport use. So in our guidance, we recommend that local plans outline clear transport and movement principles and requirements within local authorities. And one specific example is that uh, local authorities seek to create high quality infrastructure that is safe and efficient for active travel, taking into consideration things like uh, wayfinding, rest, shade and storage solutions, but also public facilities such as toilets and water fountains. Now, as part of our guidance, we also try to recognise challenges that um, local authorities may face. So in the case of uh, transport and movement related uh, content, we recognise important differences in transport um, and movement challenges that are maybe faced by those in rural communities compared with those living in more urban areas. So for example, while rural communities have access to expansive green space and coastal walks, active travel for employment, education, training, leisure is actually not always that easy. 
um, potentially due to things like narrow um, lanes with limited visibility and often limited public transport options. So as well as highlighting some of these challenges, we also discuss how these can start to be addressed through working with local communities and landowners to change the wider environment. Next slide, please. Now, as you can see here, uh, the guidance includes numerous examples from high quality adopted policies that could be relevant um, or of interest to you and your local authority. Um, and on the right hand side here, you can see that within this sub theme, we also signpost the reader to transport and movement focus resources from a range of local and national organisations. And this structure that I've described for these two example sections of the guidance um, are very much the same for each of our sub themes. So you get a get a sense of how the wider document feels. So thank you very much. That's it from me for now. I'll hand back to Gemma now, who's going to introduce our next speakers. Great. Thanks very much, Emma. Um, and so what we're going to do now is hear from um, two of the local authorities uh, that were involved, as Emma described. Um, and uh, the first person who's going to speak is uh, James Cording. James is a senior planning officer and a Healthy Places lead um, at Southampton City Council. Um, and then we'll hand over to Carrie Wood. Um, Carrie is a senior public health lead um, for the wider determinants of health at Surrey County Council. Um, so, James, um, over to you. Great. Thanks, Gemma, for that introduction. Um, and yeah, it's great to be with you all here today for the, uh, the launch of this new guidance. Um, so just as a quick starting point, for those of you who aren't familiar with Southampton, um, we're a major city on the south coast of England um, with a population of around a quarter of a million people. Um, you might know us as you, if you've taken a cruise from Southampton um, to somewhere around in, the, sort of in Europe or elsewhere. Um, some of the goods you might own might have come through our uh, large port. Um, the container port in Southampton is actually the third largest in the country. Um, you might have been passing on the way towards the New Forest uh, next door to us, or perhaps you were here for a, a Saints home game at St Mary's Stadium. Um, next slide, please. Um, so why I'm excited about, so why am I excited about this new guidance and wanted to get involved with its creation? Well, unfortunately, Southampton's population faces a number of health challenges. Now, I'm going to use life expectancy to help visualise this, as although I know it has some flaws, uh, it's a metric that most of us will be familiar with. Basically, that idea of how long might someone born in the city expect to live for. So, as you'll see on the bar chart from the left, life expectancy for males is significantly below the uh, significantly below the average for England uh, in Southampton. It's significantly below the average for England and for Hampshire, which is the county where we're located. Life expectancy is also lower than a number of our ONS comparators there, for example, um, Sheffield, Bristol and York. Uh, if you then look on, obviously, from the graph on the right, um, you'll see there's also the worrying trend of life expectancy. Uh, for males has actually been falling since it sort of reached a peak in the 2017-19 in the pooled period, um, although this is sort of part of a national trend and obviously COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic unfortunately will have played a role in that. Um, this situation is similarly also found uh, in the data for our female residents in the city as well. Uh, next slide please. Um, and of course, we also have the issue that not everyone in our population has the same health status. Um, there are significant inequalities in health outcomes and life expectancy. Uh, the graph on the, on the left shows life expectancy for males in the different wards of our city. Um, now I'm going to ignore the Bargate ward at the bottom of the graph because um, that has a few statistical anomalies as to quite why life expectancy is so high there. Um, but as you can see, basically, broadly speaking, there is a gap of around five years um, between sort of our highest uh, life ward with the highest life expectancy in the park and that with the lowest life expectancy in Thornhill. Obviously, that's, that's quite a variation there. 
Um, as you'll see from the graph on the right, males born in the most deprived parts of the city also have a life expectancy nearly eight years lower um, than those living in the least deprived parts of the city. And again, um, this sort of situation is repeated for the data for females as well. So as you'll have heard earlier, um, much of our health is determined not just by what people traditionally think of um, genetics and so on, but also but by our environment, um, those sort of those building blocks of health, your housing, access to food, uh, green space, ability to move around um, by sort of active travel. Um, and that, so we've now had a sort of a, a significant drive um, by our public health team at the City Council, who I work sort of jointly with, um, to support colleagues and other stakeholders in recognising this uh, through what sort of we're dubbing as a, a health and policies approach. Now, there's the well-known saying that prevention is better than cure, and that's something as a broader council we're now trying to work on going forward. This is to help us both improve health outcomes for our residents and reduce inequalities. Um, but as we're a unitary authority, we are also responsible for social care budgets and poor health has been a significant driver um, for people to require social care. Um, so we also want to see if we can try and reduce demand for that a little bit and try and ease some pressure on our budgets. Uh, next slide, please. So, as the custodians of our city's built and natural environments, uh, as a planning team, we appreciate there's a role for us to play in this sort of prevention agenda through the delivery of healthier places. Now, we're currently preparing a new local plan uh, to replace our existing suite of development plan documents. Uh, it's gonna be the one you see on the right, the city vision local plan. And that we and we're hoping to now incorporate health as a golden thread through that, um, much like we do for sustainable development, just because we think it makes good sense to do so. Uh, and this guidance is therefore incredibly timely in helping us to support the policy creation. Um, the guidance has a number of useful features that we're going to be looking to make use of. Uh, the health planning framework provides a clear approach for making sure that all those fundamentals are accounted for in the plan. As I said before, that's the things like and we make sort of active travel, access to green space, healthy homes, and so on. Um, it, it, this is it's even to the point of going down to um, defining what is what actually is health and what does it mean for us uh, in the local plan, which is something that sparked a, a lot of debate in the office as to uh, what should, we should write as the final words on the page. Um, there is obviously sort of the laying out of clear themes and principles that show how planning policies can be crafted to support health. Um, helpfully, as, as Emma alluded to, this includes practical examples of policies that have actually been adopted by other councils in their respective local plans. So the, having these examples means we can save time and a bit and don't have to go speculatively hunting for these um, for ourselves. As these examples are all from adopted local plans, um, we also get a clear indication of what the, the planning inspectorate has found sound at examination. And if we wanted to, we can then go further uh, and do our own exploration of, of those local plans to um, examine their evidence base to see what was presented and what was necessary to justify the policy and sort of we can then uh, adapt that for our own needs. Um, we'll also be looking to incorporate commentary in the guidance on implementing health requirements to help us ensure that our positive policy intentions actually see the delivery on the ground. Um, for example, we intend to put a new policy in place to require health impact assessments for larger scale developments. Um, but having this guidance has also made us think about adding a requirement for health management plans as well. Um, where that's sort of a, a follow on um, you do from a health impact assessment so that we can have greater certainty that sort of the, the developers or whoever is actually putting the procedures and resources in place to actually address the impacts that are identified in that health impact assessment once the development is delivered. Um, but I think the most important thing is that a guidance document like this actually now exists, is that it brings together different ideas on, how, lo on how, lo how local plans can be used to improve the health and well-being of local communities. I've now got a tool that I can refer back to to make sure as many healthy placemaking principles as possible are being addressed in our city vision. I'm also hoping to use it as part of discussions with developers, councillors, the public and other stakeholders as we help them envision the changes that we're going to need to make in our built environment to help deliver a healthier Southampton. 
Uh, and that's everything from me. So I will pass back over to Gemma. Brilliant. Thanks, James. Um, really appreciate your uh, talking about how the, the document might be useful for you. And uh, yeah, excited to see how you do end up using it. Um, and uh, one of the things I guess we should say as well is that uh, we don't think it's a finished product in that sense. We're hoping that uh, as people sort of get to use it and read it, that we'll be able to evolve it in the future. Um, and also uh, with one eye on the fact that we're uh, probably looking at national planning reform of some kind. Um, and so also keeping it up to date from that point of view. Um, so what I'll do now is hand over to Carrie. Um, and Carrie's going to say a bit about um, uh, her perspective from Surrey County Council. Carrie, are you able to join us? I've just unmuted myself, but I don't seem to have a video, but um, okay. let me just well, see if I can do that myself. There we go. <laughs> there we are. Hi, everyone. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I've had to um, join that my Surrey background because I've had a few problems joining, but um, nice to see you all today. Um, what I wanted to to explain was um, what Surrey Council Council is, is um, in different sort of solutions that we've found. So... Uh, Surrey County Council is a two-tier local government system, and so that means we've got an upper-tier local authority and then 11 districts and boroughs, and some functions are shared um, between the county and the district and boroughs, and public health uh, sits with, um, within strategic functions like transport and highways at county level. Um, and then planning is at district level. So Surrey is a diverse county and it's got um, many areas of deprivation as well and very different position locally to some of the national indices that we see and some of the health based funding allocations that we receive. Um, so if we can just go to the next slide, please. So we have our um, Surrey wide health and wellbeing board um, and that sets key outcomes for health and, um, and measurements for that, which we, re we report across um, Surrey wide. So there, um, as you say, the pockets of de deprivation and electoral wards have been identified as key neighborhoods. And so there's 21 in total. The JSNA, which is a joint strategic needs assessment um, of the current and future health and social care needs of the local community um, is, is where we um, sort of set our priorities and, and how that might be met by uh, local authorities, districts and borough councils or the NHS. And it's based on the poorest health outcomes. So with 11 districts and boroughs and different political and policy drivers and different stages in local plan making, we're trying to strive for consistency and a need for a focused and um, and resource efficient as well, approach to planning and health, as well as flexibility to cater for variation in approach. So we worked um, in um, supporting the development of this guidance with our planning colleagues at Guildford Borough Council. Um, and that you know, it gave us a really good insight into how we might use this um, guidance. So because we're a two tier authority, um, we need a really strong collaborative culture and guidance that reflects this structure. Um, so we're really um, pleased to get involved and the challenges and opportunities that that presents. So at Surrey, we also have a health in all policies approach and this guidance um, helps to set the scene and offer a menu of options. So the guidance also highlights um, the opportunities to influence health and it also explains the planning and health guidance, um, I'm sorry, landscape. Um, and uh, we thought it was good at, at setting out what good looks like. So um, if we could just move on to slide three, thank you. So this was really timely for Surrey to get involved as well, because um, it's given us the opportunity to review the approach taken, which is what we do quite regularly, um, because the whole landscape around health and policy is changing and seeing what other people are doing is, is really good. So we reflect and review the focus and we look at that at our health and planning forum and our Surrey wide working groups. And it also really points out the importance of using our JSNA data for an evidence-based approach and uh, demonstrate the need in data and local consultation. It's also um, potentially going to influence new chapters to support evidence and approaches taken uh, for our JSNA. 
but it's really good to see clear aims and some measurable outcomes and help us setting that. And it was also really interesting to see what kind of stakeholders were involved in, in different setting of plans. But more than anything, it, it really is timely to focus resources um, on, on the best approach for uh, Surrey and our districts and boroughs and how they want to proceed. So uh, talking about the uh, you know, consultation on national policy, planning policy framework, um, you know, for Surrey, we're going to potentially see significant increase in housing numbers and um, we'll be affected with quite a bit of grey belt land and what that might look uh, like for us. So it gives us an opportunity to review um, local plans and opportunities to review and improve um, where appropriate. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Carrie. And sorry about the uh, difficulties joining this afternoon, but I'm really glad you made it. Um, what I'll do is I'll ask if you and James and Emma can turn your cameras back on and then what we'll do is spend a few minutes um, trying to work through some of the questions in the Q&A box um, and if anybody wants to add any more then please do so um, and we will also see if we can post a link to the guidance in the chat um, as well uh, but it is on our website um, and you can find it there. Um, so uh, maybe we'll start uh, with an easy one uh, and maybe I'll point this to Emma. Um, so there's a question is, does the guide focus on food and diets? And then there was also a comment about whether or not local plans can deal with uh, the challenges around healthy diets. So I wonder if you could pick that up first. Great, thank you, Gemma. Um, so the quick answer of that is yes, we do have a section on um, healthy food and um, promoting healthy diets. Um, and in particular, in the guide, we talk about how um, there is the possibility for the local plan to influence the, um, I guess, the uh, collection proliferation of hot food takeaway um, areas. Um, there's also options for thinking about how homes can be designed around promoting healthy food, healthy diet, um, also guidance around opportunities for food growing. So I think one of the things that has come out over the years um, of our research and also um, practice work that I know um, Gemma has been involved with at the TCPA is you often get this comment that the local plan or planning can't influence diets. Um, we would make the case that there are these opportunities for um, being able to uh, promote healthier eating um, within our um, local areas. Um, so within our guide, we've got some examples from a range of local authorities across England where they have actually been able to put into place um, policies that can actually promote positive um, uh, healthy eating in this area. Emma? Um, James and Carrie, if at any point you want to jump in on a subject, then um, just sort of please do. Yeah. Um, if I could, Gemma, just to sort of just follow on from Emma's point. Um, I think it, yes, it, I mean, planning is not the most perhaps obvious one where people would think, oh, yes, it can influence food and diet. But um, I think from the discussions I've had with, with colleagues in public health, I think where they're trying to sort of, as they refer to it as a sort of a, a whole systems approach to tackling things like obesity. I think you have to appreciate that it's just it's such a complicated web and it's just trying to make influence and intervention and little changes across the whole system where you can and hope cumulatively um, that will sort of lead to the changes we want to see. So I think it's planning has to do its part, um, regardless of how big or small that may be. Yeah, I totally agree, James. Um Harry, I wonder if you might speak to this. So there's a question around, you know, where planning sits uh, in one place and transport planning might sit in another um, and obviously you're a two-tier authority and so you've got these this spread of functions in different places um, how do you think uh, people can work together or collaborate to to make this you know sort of healthy local plans a, a reality when the responsibilities for things lie in different places yeah, it's it's it is a it is a challenge, and and obviously we're not here to direct um, how district and boroughs, but but it's finding that consistency in approach actually, and saving some of the resources and time 
uh, reinventing the wheel. Uh, and I think that's where you can look at um, working together. Um, many of our districts and boroughs do have health, um, um, well, they all do have health in their local plans, but in picking out really good examples and sharing that. And, um, and also, you know, what works well. So public health can then support in providing the data as well um, to help evidence that. So by working together like that, you, you're, you're making a, a hopefully a better product at the end of the day. Yeah, completely. Um, so then there's also a question um, in the chat around, uh, is the guidance uh, applicable or is it useful for sort of um, more rural settings as well as more urban settings? I don't know if, um, Emma, you wanted to say anything on that? Yeah, so um, we we feel like it's applicable for all settings, in honesty, um, and that's why we've worked with um, local authority partners that represent urban and um, rural localities. Um, so I guess we probably have started from a point of a more urban perspective, um, but we have gathered that feedback from um, some some local, uh, sorry, more rural areas. Um, so we do feel that it has relevance, um, and I think once we've finish today and you have an opportunity to look at the document there will be things that will probably pop out to you more if you're from a rural locality compared with someone in a more urban area um, and then I guess a question for James and or Carrie in terms of um, the sort of changes to housing numbers um, and the drive for uh, housing but also um the importance that's placed on decision making in terms of you know economic growth and those things how how does that health thread hold its own um in terms of decision making um i wonder if yeah that's quite a big question but if you have any thoughts on 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 how that works james you came off mute so i'm gonna um, you first. i mean yeah planning planning is is always that is that balancing act isn't it and that's that's something I've, I've often had to uh, sort of explain to, to public health colleagues, um, the idea of what gets what weight and that sort of thing. And it's all sort of very subjective. Um, I think, I mean, it, it, it is always going to, there, there are potentially always trade-offs. I, I mean, I think the, the important thing that I'm, I'm always, the feedback I always get from development management colleagues is, is, is we, obviously we're trying to introduce stuff or they want stuff and it's like, is we just, it needs to get it in the plan as a policy, then you've got the full full weight of obviously of being in the development plan, and then it can be um, considered accordingly. Um, and it, it's yeah, it, it depends obviously how the argument is framed um, and things. But by, but it, sometimes sometimes just a, 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 a sort of a negative against one policy, a sort of a, a sort of a contravention of one policy in amongst others can be justification to sort of refuse refuse the development um if it is obviously so inappropriate um or otherwise it's a case of at least can you mitigate um some of the the health issues um that you're potentially presenting is it is it a way of oh if you can make this adjustment or actually if you incorporate this um it's yeah it's not always a sort of that out and out thing um out and out battle but it, it's finding the solution, trying to move forward that hopefully everyone can be as satisfied as they can be with. Uh, well, I've got you there, James. I'll also pose this question to you. Um, if a local plan is maybe already at a later stage, so maybe sort of Regulation 19, um, are there limitations, do you think, to how useful this guide could be? Or are there still other things or other recommendations that uh, we might be able to pull um in different ways of doing things yeah i mean i, th I think obviously it depends quite how far that in along that journey you are obviously if you're still working towards making your reg 19 um plan then obviously there are there's still some scope to make some changes um if you wanted to make some tweaks to things um potentially introduce some new policies after um after obviously feedback from previous stages of consultation. Um, alternatively, obviously there is the obviously the growing the um, there's the option for uh, supplementary um, planning documents. Obviously, if you want to, to produce a sort of a healthy place, you want to help to expand, um, for example, design policy to say how you're going to make 
uh, help for sort of healthy placemaking that way, or obviously to feed into design codes, um, which is obviously something we're, we're all being required to do now. Um, or likewise, I mean, is the fact that it's, yeah, with the sort of the requirement to produce plans sort of more frequently, more regularly, um, it might be a few years, but it won't be that many years off before we're, we're looking at you. You end up looking at your plan again, and then, then hopefully at that point, this guidance will be very handy. Um, if you obviously, when you're starting more from, uh, from well, not quite from potentially from scratch, but from sort of a, a, a lower baseline again. No, I agree. And I think you're right in that there's, 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 there's principles within the guidance that are helpful for probably all those things, but the, the guidance document itself is aimed at local plans in this sort of first instance. So thank you for that. Um, Emma, there's a question and I, I'll, I can come in on this as well, but there's a question of, you know, in a way, this is nothing new. And um, yeah, are we just adding another layer to the processes when you know sustainable development should incorporate um, healthy places as a consideration already? And I just wondered if you might respond to that. Yeah, sure, Gemma. And I think thank you to whoever put that question because I think um, as I touched on earlier in the presentation, there are lots of resources out there that kind of start to get us thinking about this um, whole concept of linking planning and health um, and how integral they are to each other. Um, but I think just referring to some of our research that has led to this piece of work, it seems to very much depend upon where you are working. So some teams um, seem to have really good collaboration between planning and public health, and it is very much a... Um, it's almost not thought about that the two things are linked and that we need to have this as um, a, a question to even consider. Whereas other um, local authorities that we've worked with and other local plans that we've reviewed in terms of the thing that's led us to developing this resource has really showed us that inconsistency across different areas. So it's great if you are from one of those um, areas where this is just an, um, a natural um, relationship but actually, if you are particularly, I guess, from somewhere where those establishing those early relationships and getting planning and public health talking to each other, then this could be a really useful resource for you. Thank you. I think I would just add to that that um, what we hope this does is actually provide something that's really practical. And you know, for those authorities that maybe have had less discussions around it already, will really give you almost almost a step-by-step -step guide as to how you might go about this and the things that you might want to consider. Um, and I think <clears throat> that um, there are some uh, things that it links in really nicely to, like the LGA um, recent guidance from the Quality of Life Foundation, um, because that sort of set out all the different levers that a local authority might pull and it named the local plan. And this almost is that sits in that section as well of going, so if you're gonna look at your local plan, here's how you might go about it and, and what you might do. Um, there are a couple of questions um, around sort of, what is the role of national policy in this? Um, and I probably would just say to that, that there is a role for national policy. It could be improved and the TCPA um, submitted a consultation response on the MPPF um, and that is published on our website if you would like to go and find it. Um, so the TCPA as an organisation will continue to sort of lobby for better national policy to support these things but there are hooks in the national planning policy framework as is and the planning practice guidance that allow you to do this which is why there are some local plans that have begun to and which is why we can put in this guide adopted policies from other places um, and there's also a comment in the questions about the planning inspectorate and again um, yes there is probably scope uh, for engagement with the planning inspectorate in order to achieve maybe a more consistent approach uh, when it comes to some of these things but um, again you know there, there are examples of adopted policy that um, has been examined and found sound and so it's about trying to champion that approach and not being um not being afraid to try some of these things and doing that by building your evidence base and making sure that you you start from a really good um a really good place um and one other question i'll answer because i'm right here uh is that uh if the local plan uh is not 
is not a whole sort of new local plan, but it's just a review process, then absolutely the themes and the policy ideas and uh, the process within this document can help you um, if you're looking at a local plan review rather than a wholesale uh, new local plan as well. Um, we've probably got time for maybe one or two more. Um, so maybe we'll just finish up with um, uh, something that James sort of mentioned and it was around the sort of uh, the prevention agenda and I wondered um, Carrie if um, if that's something that uh, for you as a sort of county council with all of your districts um, is that something that is a useful uh, entry point for having discussions around some of these things um, and if this sort of guidance is a good way of, of helping those discussions along. Yeah, I think for me, it's it's kind of always reviewing what stakeholders you you have at the table and those relationships and building that. So, you know, having um, a regular conversation with our NHS estates colleagues and looking at um, public health role in preventative versus sort of, you know, building for health as well. So um, I think that's, you know, for me, it's, it's it's really good to just review that and see who's there and, um, and, and what they're adding. And are, are there any other sort of communities as well that are doing a lot of preventative work and the um, voluntary sector um, is a big part of that? Um, I think that um, what I'll do is, um, wrap up there and just say um, thank you very much to, um, to Emma, to James and to Carrie um, for uh, joining this conversation. Um, as we've mentioned, the guidance um, is available on our website. The link uh, was posted in the chat. Um, and if you would like to get in touch um, with the TCPA or uh, with Emma, then um, our email addresses are on that slide there. Um, we would um, really appreciate it if you could take the time to complete a webinar evaluation form um, and you can do that by using that QR code. Um, and if you're interested in continuing to hear from uh, the TCPA and TRUDE, both organisations have uh, newsletters that send out um, information about what's going on. Um, we will send out an email um, after this webinar to let people know um, where to find all these things as well. So if you can't uh, use the QR codes, that's fine. Um, but we are just really grateful that we've had the opportunity to work together on this. Um, and the TCPA uh, would like to thank um, Sport England for supporting uh, the healthy placemaking work of us um, and obviously uh, for uh, TRUDE, uh, UK PRP as well. Um, and if people uh, would like to see what other events are coming up for the, from the TCPA, um, please visit our website um, and we look forward to continuing to work with you um, as, the, uh, as the year goes on. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming along and uh, we will see you again soon. <laughs>